My love for agriculture started in kindergarten. My teacher, Ms. Smith, asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And truthfully, I've been watching way too much Buffy the Vampire Slayer that I even knew the dance intro. So I obviously told her I wanted to become a vampire slayer. Frantically, she called my mom and advised me to choose something else. So I did what any other normal horse girl would do, become an equine veterinarian. I had never gone horseback riding, but I knew I wanted to work with large animals, and I begged my mom to take me horseback riding for months until she finally said yes. That's when I knew I needed to study. You see, for some odd reason, I thought they were going to quiz me on the anatomy of the horse and the tack that would be needed to ride the horse. I studied up until the very last minute when my mom yelled for me to get into the car. I felt alive and free while riding the horse. Not only did I feel free because of the interaction with this magical creature, but also because it was an outlet for my childhood self to get away from being bullied. I had recently gone from a diverse school to a predominantly rich white school. Kids would make fun of me for my hair, my skin color, the dresses my mom had sewn for me, and many other things. But this led me to want to change my appearance so I could feel accepted. So every night, I'd say a prayer to God Please let me have blue eyes and straight hair when I wake up. I would skip afternoon swim practice so I wouldn't get a tan. I wore my hair up in a tight bun from second grade to eighth grade so I wouldn't have to hear the comments about how my hair is ugly and messy. I felt alone. My dad was working two hours away and my mom was a sweet French lady whom I didn't think would understand American racism. It wasn't until a beautiful and bright girl, Kennedy, who walked into my fifth grade class and became my best friend. You see, Kennedy didn't care about my hair or my skin color or my clothes or anything. She just wanted to crack jokes, help people, and play soccer. We remained best friends all throughout middle school too, but things started to shift in eighth grade. She had to go get surgery for a brain tumor. And although I was 13, I didn't understand the weight of the situation. Thankfully, her surgery went well, and all of her best friends and I were able to play with her in the hospital gym afterwards. Everything was relatively okay until the cancer came back stronger than before. She had stage four terminal brain cancer. Having to overhear from the adults say that your best friend is only expected to live four months from now places a chokehold on all of your future aspirations. In April, we reached out to Drake, Kennedy's favorite artist at the time, asking him to come and visit Kennedy. And on his only day off, he came and visited Kennedy and all of her friends and family. Gradually, the brain cancer took over her normal motor functions, but I would visit, hold her hand, talk to her, and read her some of her favorite books. I felt an immense amount of guilt for not being a better friend. Throughout elementary and middle school, I wanted to be seen and accepted. So I believed I needed to change to fit the mold everyone had for me, that I needed materialistic items to be cool and popular, that I needed to be someone else than who I truly was to be accepted. This led me to not being the best supportive friend at the time. I was so caught up trying to impress people who didn't even accept the authentic me. Filled with guilt, sadness, and anger, the only thing that brought me some type of solace was being in nature, gardening, or interacting with animals. I no longer cared what people thought about my hair, what clothes I owned, or what people thought of me. I just wanted to crack one more joke with my best friend just one last time. I knew that wherever I went, I'd have to bring my true self. So we all create an image of contentment and a path to achieve it, as this gives us a sense of purpose. With the contentment that nature brought me, I learned more about food security, nutrition, and sustainability. I grew food in my backyard with my parents and learned how racial inequities played within our food system. With that, I grew a sense of purpose and made it my life's journey to alleviate food insecurity. When I was a freshman on campus, I vividly remember my intro to animal science course where we took a trip down to the Governor Bill and Vera Daniel Farm. I remember seeing so much potential as to what we could do and how the students could take part. I remember writing up different projects and how we could achieve them, how we'd get the funding, and what an impact this would make 
to support not only the university, but also the citizens of the cities nearby us. I pitched my idea to professors, administrators, and peers. And while everyone loved the idea, they just said, I hope you're able to make this come true. Dumbfounded, I'm like, well, could you potentially help me out? And without a veil, I would always hit the wall with the words, oh, sorry, I'm too busy, or just wait until we have somebody who can help you out. I couldn't stand those answers, and I didn't want to give up. So I'd go back to the drawing board, ran a bit to my friends, and eventually asked my dad for advice. He would always say, no just means not yet, or you're not asking the right person. So I shared my message with anyone who would listen in hopes that someone would see the value in creating a student-led garden that would allow for students to get connected with their food and allow the communities around us to not be food insecure. The closest store that has affordable, fresh, and nutrient-dense food was 20 miles away from campus, yet we had approximately 800 acres of farmland. It wasn't until Dr. James A. Wilson Jr., my mentor, professor, and motivator, listened to my story, and instead of saying, I wish you well, shocked me with, you're the person I've been waiting for. Within a year, we received a $15,000 foundational grant for the student garden to get started. Not only that, but the vision would include the collaboration of the College of Agriculture and the College of Business to eventually start a farmer's market. Everything felt like it was finally coming together, but other people had different plans for this vision. Instead of this being about the impact that it would make for the wellness of the university and the surrounding cities, it became a game of who would get the most recognition. The project's primary focus was no longer about how we can help those around us eat healthy. It, was, it became about profit and glory. Similarly to other creatives, ideas can get hijacked. But in moments when aspired outcomes don't work out as you had envisioned, you can either persist with what you believe is right, or you can freeze, rest, and work at it in another, in another angle. I chose the latter and Dr. Wilson gave me the validation to rest, pivot, and keep pushing on. He always encouraged me to do more and be more with the opportunities that the university and the world provided. As he always said to his students, don't be typical. In 2019, I applied to three different programs that would allow me to further my dream of becoming a farmer and a medical doctor who helped build up black and indigenous communities through their food systems. I attended the Summer Institute for Emerging Managers and Leaders at the University of California to learn more about business and build relationships with people who are already passionate about that field. I was able to participate in a case study, present our ideas to Booz Allen Hamilton representatives, and secured funding for an MBA. Next, I was off to Switzerland and Croatia to study food security and nutrition through the School of International Training. While there, I was able to choose a research topic that interested me. I decided I would talk about racism in agriculture, but the major issues that I faced were, one, I had absolutely no one to interview in Switzerland about American racism in agriculture. Two, the people that were talking about this topic were not getting the recognition that they deserved. Thus, it was not easily searchable. And three, after emailing and cold calling major agriculture companies and nonprofits, I, they all said something similar to, I don't know of any racial issue that exists in agriculture, or I simply wouldn't get a response. I was bummed, but I did have one person get back to me and say that I could interview them. Ms. Lindsley Lunsford from Tuskegee University and I were able to discuss the atrocities that had been put up against black people, Native Americans, and Latinx people. I had found that 97% of the arable agriculture land in the United States was owned by white people. In 1910, 14% of U.S. farmers were black and collectively owned 16 million acres. By 1997, fewer than 20,000 farmers were black and collectively owned 2 million acres. That's a drastic change from 1 million farmers to less than 20,000 farmers. Since the 1920s, there's been a steady decline in the number of black individuals who will operate farms in the United States. If African-American farmers had left agriculture at the same rate as white farmers since the 1920s, there would still be 300,000 black farmers left, as Pete Daniel stated in his book, Dispossession. Natives 
are two to four times more likely to be food insecure, largely as a result of living in remote locations where food supplies are scarce. In 2011, the racial makeup of farm workers were 28.6% white, 3.4% black, and 65.3% Hispanic. Farm workers are excluded from federal overtime requirements, and they used to be excluded from federal minimum wage requirements. With all of these statistics, how could I not want to create change? My work in racism and agriculture didn't halt there, but days after my adventure in Switzerland, I traveled to China to participate in the Jurqing Fellowship, where students from China and students from the United States interacted to help build relationships between these two countries. It wasn't until I was in China where I realized I had signed up for the wrong part of the program. I signed up for the technology part of the program instead of the sustainability part of the program. So even though I accidentally marked X on the wrong box, I have now been able to further mesh the idea of agriculture and big data together. Embrace collaboration within yourself using the knowledge and passion that you're most comfortable with and intertwine that with something that you have very little knowledge about. By participating in all three of these experiences, I've been able to remain resilient, adapt to challenges that are in front of me, and add more to the Prairie View community. Prairie View A&M University. The name has changed several times from Alta Vista Agriculture and Mechanical College for the Colored Youth to Prairie View State Normal and Industrial College. Even though change is inevitable, the three values on the Prairie View Insignia remain true for success as a student today. Research, teaching, and service. Through research, you'll be able to see what you enjoy, what piques your interest, what you don't enjoy doing. Always be willing to place yourself in front of opportunities regardless of the outcome. By conducting research, I have met lifelong friends, traveled to three different countries, and found my passion. Even though we come to college to be taught by others, there are plenty of time where the role switches, where the student is now the teacher. Those around you may not have the same resources, opportunities, or experiences as you. When this happens, be sure to share an internship opportunity, a scholarship, or even introduce them to someone who can help them further achieve their goals. I learned that from Kennedy, the essence of compassion. Uh, she gave me the courage to stop trying to be like someone else. Now, I advocate for others to strive for their best and support them when they fall. So, this is your reminder. Wherever you go, make sure to bring you with you. Service comes in many forms, and Dr. Wilson was a, a service to others by truly listening and uplifting his students. You could find students running in and out of his office, just needing to vent, and he would give his undivided attention to make sure that they were taken care of. Find a mentor that supports you, and be sure to give back to the communities that are around you. By volunteering with nonprofits, you can help others and build relationships with other bridge builders. I was able to do this through Agriculture Future of America, where they provide students with the opportunity to interact with industry professionals and the FarmLink Project, a group of students working nationwide to combat food insecurity amid the ongoing pandemic by bringing food from farms with surplus crop to those in need. The FarmLink Project was started in April 2020 when a group of university students couldn't stand the idea of billions of pounds of food going to waste every year and millions of people going hungry every day. They risked the idea of starting a nonprofit to change that. And now the Farmlink Project has delivered over 24 million pounds of food to families in need. So tell your idea to others, work on it, fail at it, and learn from it. When you're passionate about a topic, it can be incredibly hard to keep it to yourself from talking to everyone else about it. I kept telling people about my vision for a student garden until finally someone said yes two years later. You don't have to have everything figured out. You just have to bet on yourself and go. As Dr. Wilson always said, don't be typical. In July of 2014, Kennedy passed away. And while I lost my best friend, she taught me how to be a better advocate for myself and for those who need support. 
I now aspire to create a farm that helps build up black and indigenous communities. With the injustices that go on within the agriculture field, I know that I'll be able to shine some of Kennedy's light onto the work that I'm be, I will be doing. So I leave you with this. We all go to work to get rich, but what are you truly enriching?